Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, this is Field Trip with Marianne Barkhouse, Diane Boss, Sarah Fuller, and Penelope Stewart in conversation with Justine Khalil. My name is Chelsea Ryan, and I am the Programs and Gallery Assistant at the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery at the Harborfront Centre in Toronto. Before we begin, I hope you will join me in acknowledging the history, culture, and stewardship of the land of this region's Indigenous people, most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit, a Mississauga Ojibwa First Nation. We seek to live in respect, peace, and right relations with them as we live and work upon their traditional territory. We are so pleased to be online with this conversation today between Marianne Barkhouse, Diane Boss, Sarah Fuller, Penelope Stewart, and Justine Khalil, Assistant Curator at the Power Plant. Today's event will be recorded and accessible online on the Power Plant's Vimeo and YouTube page, The Power Plant TO. This program is a part of Field Trip Art Across Canada, which is a new online platform that delivers art experiences with some of Canada's most celebrated artists in an international or national partnership with over 45 leading arts organizations. For full biographies on our featured artists and to learn more about Field Trip online, please visit fieldtrip.art. I would now like to introduce the presenters. Marianne Barkhouse was born in Vancouver, BC. She graduated with honors from the Ontario College of Art in Toronto and has exhibited widely in Canada and the United States, while her work is a part of major collections across Canada. Inspired by issues surrounding empire and survival, Barkhouse creates installations that evoke consideration of the self as a response to history and environment. Diane Boss's photographs have been exhibited internationally in numerous group and solo exhibitions since 1981. Many of Boss's recent exhibitions feature work made with handmade cameras, walk-in light installations, and sound pieces. These tools and devices formulate and extend her investigations of journeying, time, and the science of light. Sarah Fuller works in photography, video, and installation. Habitats, refuge, and alternate interpretations of landscape are central themes. Sarah has been an artist in residence at Banff Center for Arts and Creativity and Fondazione Antonio Ratti, Italy. Sarah's work is in public and private collections, including the Canada Council for the Arts Art Bank, the Walter Phillips Gallery, and Global Affairs Canada. Penelope Stewart is an artist working across the various media of sculpture, architectural installations, experimental photography, and works on paper. Stewart received an MFA from the State University of New York at Buffalo and in 2010 was elected to the Royal Canadian Academy of the Arts. Through 2018 and 19, she was the Nick Novak Fellow at Open Studio in Toronto, which allowed her the time for further research and exploration of analog photo techniques. Justine Khalil is an assistant curator at the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery in Toronto, Ontario. Since joining the Power Plant, she has curated shows by Beth Stewart, Thomas J. Price, and Howie Choi, and assisted on exhibitions by Ellen Gallagher, Shuvanai Ashuna, and Naufos Ramirez Frigora. Khalil holds a curatorial MFA from OCAD University and a BA from the University of Alberta with a focus in art, design, and visual culture. We will now begin the conversation and Justine will begin sharing a slideshow presentation. Welcome. Welcome to Field Trip. It's so nice to see you all. Um, I'm thrilled to be speaking with you all today. Uh, we have about 45-50 minutes so I'm just going to jump right in because there's lots of ground to cover. Um, I thought that we could start by speaking to each of you individually and then uh, get into your collective research and how you all got to know one another, which from previous conversations is a, a bit of a tangled web. <laughs> so. Um, but I do also see a lot of overlap in your interests from analog cameras to concerns about the environment, um, which I imagine makes for a very fruitful conversation. Um, I thought that we could start maybe with Penelope, um, since we'd originally reached out to her to participate in this field trip program, and she generously suggested that we invite Marianne, Diane, and Sarah to also take part. So Penelope, uh, you, like your colleagues, have an active interest in alternative or historic photographic methods such as camera obscura, pinhole cameras, um, et cetera. Oh, also these really beautiful, amazing orbs uh, that you created. So I think actually that you had a major first pinhole camera while in Italy with Diane, and we can kind of get to that in a second. But I'm wondering if you can start by telling us a bit about what attracted you to this method of art making. And I think maybe we could start with Terminal, uh, one of your earlier works. So if you don't mind talking us through the process of making Terminal, um, how you came to experiment um, 
with these types of printmaking processes and then these other types of photographic methods. Right. Um, I've always, for as long as I can remember, I've always been interested in alternative and historic methods in photography. Um, and when I was in undergrad, I just wanted to make them big. And <laughs> so printmaking seemed to answer that, um, that sort of call. And I um, was able, and, and I, I was able to work in black and white, um, which had, was the sort of the attraction. I did explore uh, alternative methods um, through the classes I was taking in undergrad, such as cyanotype and um, Van Dyke. But I just, I sort of developed my own process of creating these huge photographs and then creating these mobile architectures. So this was, um, this was a piece that actually um, had diff different permutations. Um, uh, I took it to Australia. It was shown in Calgary. Um, and then it was shown in Buffalo um, in different places and it, and it, it, it changed how, it, how its form. Um, this was an abandoned train station and I just, it was kind of a guerrilla piece where we went in and um, wove 500 yards of um, fabric that I had printed and then sewn together. The image is taken, a black and white image that I took and, and kind of uh, worked with um, is taken actually from the growing vaults of um, the War Memorial at Hart House in Toronto, at the University of Toronto. Uh, I was really interested in that kind of architecture. So that, that became where, and I was interested in the ideas of layering um, the double exposure. So all of those things kind of were in the background and kind of went into this architectural work. And then, and then what happened was I was invited to do a project um, again, I decided to make a huge um, architectural photograph uh, that was sort of 12 feet high. And as I was photographing the preliminary piece, it was a glass um, cloche. And as I was looking at the cloche, I looked at the handle, the knob at the very top, and it had turned in, it had turned everything upside down like the camera obscura. Mm. And I had that moment where your heart kind of flutters, where you go, this is really, this is exciting. And this is where I want to be. So um, there were other projects, of course, in the mix at that point. I was going back to Australia. I was a resident in a glass factory there for two months. And while I was there, I was working on another project. But while I was there, I made a small glass orb, which of course now... Yeah. These ones, yes. right? Yeah. That's right. So I made this at the glass factory. Of course, now you can buy these things, you know, but at that time it was, um, but my idea was that it was like a handhold lens that I would, you know, in my palm would be looking. Mm -hmm. And um, so this is, this is a beaver pond. Um, and this was a project that I did up at uh, the Tree Museum or was part of the project I did at the Tree Museum. So the interest became, so then I became totally re-engaged and um, I was invited to do a piece in the Halliburton Forest and I thought I want to build a camera obscura. But I was concerned that I really, that the laws of physics would not work for me. And so I needed to kind of take a, um, some sort of primer or course on the kind of fundamental of the, of the camera obscura, the, the camera itself. And I was lucky enough to connect with Diane Boss and she was offering a course in Italy. So I um, took the course. <laughs> and uh, in that course, I ended up making several cameras. But one of the other generous things that Diane did for me, knowing that I wanted to build a camera obscura, was to help me transform a room into a camera obscura. Oh, wow. So I really had an idea of how it would work. Is this, so this, is this the one? This is, so this is actually the piece that I built after uh -huh. um, after the course with Diane. So I think I, in May, I went to visit with Diane and then in July, I was up in the forest and uh, we built this hut and Marianne was in that uh, symposium, that sculpture symposium as well. And so she would come in and help me chink all the spaces in between the slats so that all the light was um, uh, hidden. Um, and I should have painted the walls white, but I just love the look of the chink. 
so the image is really um, not as crisp as it would be if you were in the room. It was it was quite magical because it was actually more like a small video. Um, mm. The whole of the camera obscura was in the roof, so you have these beautiful sky images sort of floating onto the floor and the tree canopy, and then up the walls, and then you would watch clouds walk, you know, move around the room. Um, subsequent years, I actually did go back and and paint the inside so that. Um, so that it was clearer, you know, but it was the idea of being able to walk inside the camera. Um, if you go yeah. back, uh, Justine, to the previous yeah. images. So wonderful thing that I did, this is a stereoscopic camera that um, Diane told me how to make. Um, it's a foam core camera with masking tape, lots of masking tape. Um, and I was able to take to start to work with double exposures and that idea of stereoscope. And then the, the next slide below that is um, the, the Illy coffee can camera, the famous wonderful bend. And again, this is, um, you know, it was a wonderful, it was a wonderful opportunity. And then the photograph on the other side is, is a photograph that I took with this camera and it had about a three to four hour exposure. I just left it there all day um, and came back and then developed it. So um, from there, though, I became, uh, I continued to work in pinhole. I had worked in cyanotype and done, done some large cyanotypes for um, the mural projects at York University that I was involved in. And then, um, but then kind of left it by my, beside me, you know, mm -hmm. always on the side um, while I was working on these other big installations. And then you kind of returned to it um, in 2019, is that right? Yeah. Yes. It was it was 2018, actually. 2018. We, um, I went back to Italy, this time France, to work with Diane and Sarah. And uh, we we would go to these, um, uh, uh, I just, anyway, like basically um, street sales. And uh, I was just looking for anything. I bought a whole lot of junk. I don't know what I'm ever going to do with it, but I bought that stuff and I bought some linens and and then I found this little book in the garbage pail, actually, of a little book, a secondhand bookstore. And I just kind of liked the, the size of it and I opened it up and it was this beautiful little book of, um, of pages of uh, plates of of botanical drawings um, and then on in, in further investigation, I. Um, I saw the, uh, you know, that it was that was made in 1860. It was printed in 1860. It was um, it was a, a letterpress, which is sort of gives you that little embossment on the paper. But it was in bad shape. Every page was crumbling. The spine mm. was falling apart. So what I suddenly, after playing with it a little bit and reading it and investigating it, I decided, you know, what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to carefully undo all the pages. I'm going to reprint the pages as cyanotype, and then I'm going to rebind the book. So re so deconstruct it, and then reconstruct it with the new pages that I did in cyanotype. And because I, of the front and back issues, I ended up having to put in more one more uh, double the pages. Um, so I decided to work with a Japanese paper that was very fine, mm. um, and sort of taught myself how to. Um, manipulate the paper because it's so fine right. um, and then we rebound the book itself. Um, what I really what I really love about this kind of trajectory is that it seems as though like you're very interested in architectural space yes. at the beginning and it seems as though you've kind of worked with these photographic processes that also involve a lot of kind of architecture around them whether yes. it's like yeah. creating an architecture uh, with the glass orbs or you know something that you can as a room that you can physically walk into a book kind of all these different spaces uh, I think people often think of photographs as like very two-dimensional and, and they can be but I like that you're exploring it in a, almost a three-dimensional way throughout yeah. throughout all these works. I think that's what attracted me originally to installation was kind of like being able to get inside the painting or get inside the photograph. And so it seemed like, and, and I started to notice that even my drawings and prints were actually coming off the wall. They were finding ways mm. to be, you know. So, and this is this was one of the other books that I did during my fellowship. Um, I had been collecting for about, um, about 15 years, I'd been collecting images of clouds with this idea that 
sort of utopian or sort of, you know, uh, uh, to idea that we share the same sky globally and, you know, and sort of, so I decided I wanted an atlas made of clouds. So I um, used the process Diazo, which is a, a 21st century or 20th century um, uh, blueprint process. And I took a selection of my cloud images and turned them into maps. So they're folded inside the book and you can unfold them. Um, and you know, and I, I was inspired too by um, Susan Stewart's map of the world um, and that idea that, that, you know, so that is, so that's how that, and then um, reverting back to architecture, I think the last image, yeah, these, these were um, images of uh, El Palisadia uh, in, in Madrid, uh, Cristal, yeah. And it's now, it's an empty greenhouse. I had all this time, I've still been photographing and working with this idea of greenhouses and the relationship between, to me, the, the old Victorian or um, European greenhouses um, and photography is that they were happening around the same time, the, the whole sort of science of them. So we learned how to form glass, cast iron, um, photographic techniques were happening. So it was a real age of, of science at that point. And so somehow or other that they sort of collapsed for me. Um, and as well, I, I, these images don't necessarily reflect that, but um, other images where um, at the end of the, during First World War, actually they would take the glass out of, um, that would be broken. And so they would use old glass negatives and put the insert them into these greenhouses, which I thought was a really interesting um, idea. This project, um, this is a greenhouse that is no longer used as a greenhouse. It's actually used as an exhibition site, um, but it was empty when we were there. And I love the emptiness compared to some of the other projects that I'd done where the greenhouse was full and packed with the sort of utopian vision of the garden. Yeah. Um, and this is a and this is kind of a theme also that runs through I think a lot of the work that all four of you uh, are doing is this kind of engagement with flora and fauna and actually if it's okay just because I'm cognizant of the time yes I'm, 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 I, I want to loop in Marianne actually um, because she's also dealing with with these issues but in a, a bit of a different way and so yeah. I was hoping to bring her into the conversation and start talking a bit about her sculptural work and also you know, like, like how you kind of developed your practice, um, starting with something and then kind of evolving into other forms uh, or other materials and methods. I think what's really interesting about Marianne is that it seems as though she was exploring these different materials concurrently. So working with bronze, working with sculpture, working with cyanotype. So I was hoping that maybe she could speak a bit to, um, to how she came to work with these materials and kind of came to work with them concurrently, because I think that's that's quite interesting. So I, I don't see you on oh, my screen, sure. Marianne. Here you are. What's that? Hi. Yeah, Hi. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Can you? Uh, yes, the, um, I got, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned about all the materials because uh, the more I, I tell myself, I just can't deal with all these different materials. I should try and focus, like just focus <laughs> on bronze, but then I have the attention span of a grasshopper and I get really interested <laughs> in the, as, these other formats. And um, like, for example, cyanotype and just, I love, um, I think with all of the materials, especially bronze and some of the photo processes like cyanotype and pinhole, I also love the, um, the history behind them and being cognizant of that, combining them for that, for these purposes. So with, um, with cyanotype, for instance, I was uh, interested to know to find out that uh, Edward Curtis, who is uh, noted for a lot of documentation of indigenous people across the Americas, uh, I don't know, but about a hundred ish years ago, mm -hmm. um, a lot of his field um, images that he did in the field were cyanotypes, and so I'm look. I thought that was interesting to go back to this fellow that was looking at indigenous cultures and then 
sort of taking that and using that process to look at my, my, myself, my own situation, my own community, but also others around me. Because of course my community totally um, involves things like, um, you know, orcas and beavers and <laughs> all those kinds of things. I like the a, a phrase that I think it was Candace Hopkins um, used to describe my work a while ago, which she said that Marianne likes or Barkhouse likes to um, disrupt the anthropocentric gaze. And I thought, yes, I think mm -hmm. that might be what I'm doing. I'm mm -hmm. not sure, but maybe. <laughs> um, so pieces also with the, the work and how this ties in with um, my travels with my, my friends here. Oh, uh, yes. I wanted to talk to you about that. So um, you had sent me this amazing image of the seagull chick that you and I think Sarah saw in Venice yes. in that, at the Biennale so, in 2019. So it's an yeah, and I was exactly. I was admittedly so this... a bit confused at first. I was like, I don't know why this <laughs> image is included in this slideshow. But once we got to talking and you kind of explain like how important place is to the work that you make, I mean, yeah, it all makes sense. But that's a, that's I, yeah, a classic tell. way. <laughs> oh, sorry, that's a classic way of describing someone's re 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 uh, response to my work. I was confused, <laughs> and I went, "Yes, <laughs> perfect." Um, the uh, well, I guess these works with some of the images that I've chosen, I'm trying to sort of show how my experience and my experience of place manifest themselves in my artwork. So mm -hmm. this little seagull chick was, uh, as you say, uh, I saw in, at the Venice Biennale. I was um, it was right beside the the Switzerland pavilion and I was about to go along the walkway to the next pavilion so it was almost right as soon as I went into the Giardini and of course it immediately subverted my gaze because then I was I just started worrying about this little because I, I saw this this little thing and he was darting in and out of the walkway as the parent gull was feeding him so the parents were up on top of that uh, that wall that you see there. And then, so there, mm. I Googled uh, seagulls as parents right away and found that they're very good parents and that they're very protective. So I thought, well, that's good, but I was still worried that someone was gonna like step on it or, or you know. Um, so that colored my yeah. experience of the Venice Biennale that year. But then if you go to, mm. <laughs> and he was an awesome Yeah, and then you made guy. these works. Actually there was, these work what's that? Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say then you made these works that kind of reference the animals that you encountered in Venice. Yes, so then this was a sort of fast forward uh, several months. I was in the, um, uh, I, I was invited to participate by Mona Philip at the Koffler to be part of the undomesticated exhibition. And so I did this piece, it's called Service. And it's, uh, I guess the overarching theme is things that foxes eat. So there's a ceramic, so it's all a ceramic sort of table installation. Uh, and foxes eat similar things, whether you're in Europe or whether you're there in uh, Canada, uh, somewhat. Um, but then I thought, oh yes, foxes eat, well, like small baby birds. And that would be exactly the kind of thing that I would worry about. So that's where <laughs> the, the small uh, baby seagull or the little seagull chick got in there. Of course that seagull chick is probably like a great big seagull now, probably beating <laughs> up the pigeons in Venice. <laughs> and uh, the other thing that, you know, that I, I'm, I always, uh, I'm on rat patrol wherever I go. So whatever city I go across Canada, I always like to dedicate, or not Canada, the world, I dedicate a certain amount of time to seeing, because the rats are always there somewhere. And in Venice, they have a lot of rats. So, uh, mm -hmm. but they're very, you know, they're, they, they, they keep well hidden to themselves. So again, you have a uh, uh, a quick uh, version, I guess, of some of the things that have uh, I've experienced in one place and how they came to inhabit my installation. Yes, and also uh, Pedro the donkey, which I love. <laughs> so you first encountered <laughs> Pedro in uh, when you were in southern France, and uh, he's actually kind of made his way into your new body of work. Do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, how you came to be in southern France, and then also how Pedro has kind of uh, wormed his way into the work that you're making now? Oh, sure thing. Well, he's, uh, I was first uh, alerted to Pedro's existence by Diane. So this is when um, I went to Lorraine where, uh, where, where Diane and Sarah were holding uh, uh, their, the workshop. 
um, in alternative photo photographic processes. And just outside the village, which is, oh, I don't know, about all of a 20 second walk from Diane's place, she said, there's this donkey and he sounds like a boiler that's about to explode or something <laughs> like that whenever, because when he gets going with uh, like making his donkey noise, he's, um, he's quite formidable. Uh, but he's a he's he's an awesome uh, character that he, he moves from different past pastures and he uh, I first I would go up and if I had a carrot or something he would be super nice and really friendly and if I didn't have a carrot well then he would start like bucking around and being irritated and then run away <laughs> so he is he's the donkey of many moods I have to say um, but with in combination with the architecture and and all the other um, things. Well, uh, Diane can explain uh, better about the location than I, I can, but it, um, I was trying to collect the, the inspiration of this place and the, the antiquity of this place. So when, uh, when we went to the Vide Grenier, that was the word that Penelope was yes, looking that for. Was it's it. like Thank a, you. <laughs> um, yeah, it was, uh, they're like a big garage sale or boot sale, you know. Mm. Um, they, uh, there was these, uh, I, I went to, to Loran thinking that I would like to um, do cyanotype on uh, linen because I had previously worked with a lot of other fabrics and cyanotype, but I'd never worked with linen. And I thought that would make an, uh, a nice finer, like just as far as the quality, finer grained kind of options available. Um, so I thought, what, what a great uh, place to pick up linen was that this Vive Grenier, because then you could have these like, over here, if you bought these same linens, there are hundreds of dollars, but over there, they're like, I don't know, 15 bucks, 17 bucks. Um, so, and then of course we got the linen and then I would cut it up or use it as, you know, we use the linen in various different ways, uh, all of us, but. Um, so this is this on the, on the left-hand side is a sample of a piece that I did while I was in Loran. So it's like a little tester piece um, that has Pedro. Uh, and that ornate ironwork from the, the farm gate that he was at, I used that as a, a pattern for doing embroidery work. And I was superimposing on some of these prints, different types of um, local uh, plants that I've found during my walks around the village. Um, so then fast forward again, about a year or so, uh, a year and a half to now, and I'm, this is sort of the extension of those experiments that I was doing on the right hand side. Um, it's a piece that I'm currently working on called Tapestry 2 um, to build a better lodge. And it's part of the Tea Towels of Insurrection series. And so what I'm doing is juxtaposing uh, the, those documents that you see represented in the, uh, on the top image are historical documents of treaties from the 1700s with, um, in this case, it's uh, the indigenous. It's a peace and friendship treaty between the indigenous people of the Montreal area uh, and the um, and the colonial forces. And then over top of that, I've embroidered um, signs uh, from protest signs from contemporary uh, indigenous protests uh, from my experience in my lifetime. So in this example, I'm sort of juxtaposing um, like a regional view to some of these. So it's the Peace and Friendship uh, Agreement for, our, for Montreal. And there's the Justice for Joyce, which is part of the protest uh, about the treatment uh, of the woman who, uh, the indigenous woman who died mm -hmm. while she was in the hospital last year. So this is sort of the direction that that series is taking, but all of this um, working with Diane and Sarah and Penelope the, the cross-pollination of, I guess, ideas and techniques and how history, diff, these different histories of place um, from France and like from Europe and not just France, but actually Europe and the new, new world, I see how they've been affecting each other. And it's really exciting to, um, yeah, to, to follow that, uh, to follow those threads as it were. Yes, yes. I think that's a nice Sorry. spot to, no, that's perfect. I think it's also a nice spot to kind of bring Diane into the conversation too. Um, and I actually want to tell like a, a nice aside or a fun aside, which is that you um, and Diane actually met while you were at the Harborfront Center and the power plant respectively. Yes. And also quite possibly um, cross paths while you were playing in two separate bands in the 80s. 
So that, maybe in like Toronto, right. or Ontario. Yeah. So I, th I just think it's great that like, there's all these kind of different connections that you, that you all have and some of them go way back. And um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask Diane if uh, she could speak a bit about how her early career in music influences the way that she creates visual arts. I can go to yeah. Diane's yeah. slide. This work probably uh, isn't an example. This is probably stuff is not an example, but <laughs> it's a good segue into what we were doing um, in France together. So um, I started. I'm just going to talk about the cyanotype a little bit mm -hmm. here because we were all uh, interested in working with um, uh, cyanotype and also with found materials and again plants so that are indigenous from that area. Um, but also finding other materials to work with when you're talking about that we all like to almost make three dimensional photographs. I think, um, you know, that, that it's true. And so in this case, I took a, an architecture book from the 1870s that had uh, beautiful architecture prints. Generally people get, you know, buy these things, the individual prints at flea markets. Um, and frame them, but um, I managed to find a, a mother load of them. And so I didn't feel bad actually using the pages to do other work on top of. So these are um, basically the structure, plant structures on top of architectural structures. And, and you know, a lot of architecture from that time period had influence from, from the structure of plants, certainly, you know, metal work and wrought mm -hmm. iron and so on. So it was kind of interesting to juxtapose these things. And if, people are familiar with my work, you see this is quite different from other stuff I've, I've done before. At the same time, it works with some of the current work that I've been doing where I put um, even materials on top of photographs while I'm printing them. So it, it adds this three-dimensional quality and brings in actual, you know, the, the, the plants and the objects are participating in, in making the image. So it's definitely analog and, and not Photoshop because it's the kind of work that you, you know, couldn't do mm -hmm. with Photoshop in the same way. But um, just to go back to the music, yeah, I feel like, uh, you know, we bonded because it was like that we both worked in a coal mine or something, Mary Ann, and survived or something. Um, That's but, true. Um, That's very yeah. true. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the things, because I started doing pinhole photography around the same time as I was as I was doing music and in university in the in the 1970s, of course, it was the whole punk movement. But mm -hmm. there was something about uh, of, you know, doing photography at the same time and, and, and you know, uh, working with bands is a, a team uh, effort in, in most cases. And, uh, and so it takes a lot of energy because there's a lot of people involved. So actually making my own cameras and doing this stuff in the dark room uh, was very meditative. And so in, in some ways I started doing these things side by side, but there was also this passage of time that happens with pinhole photography um, each, you know, the early images that I did in the 80s, the exposure times were around um, three to five minutes, which was kind of the length of songs, you know. Um, and so this, these events would happen during these exposures and, um, you know, like a story would unfold. So even though it's a still image, it's a still image of a passage of time. And when I was writing music, uh, a lot of the, the inspiration for the music was from visual images or about places. And so there was a, a thematic thing happening there. And it's, it's interesting, I was just thinking now of the jump, there's a video that we did as part of Perfect World in 1985, 1986, um, which is called Have a Good Look. And it, it talks, it's about looking at um, industrial farming and what we're doing to the environment. You know, this is 35 years ago. Uh, we're all, we're dealing with the same issues. Yeah, not here. much has changed, unfortunately. No, and and so it, and actually, my most recent work, which you're going to get to, I think, in another slide, which is looking mm -hmm. at the biodiversity gardens, yeah. um, is kind of really ties in with that work and the ideas behind the video. We did that one. We did another uh, song called Vacation in Black, which we filmed in Mexico and initially it was supposed to be, the idea behind it was this kind of um, ecotourism and how uh, often that actually destroys the thing that the people are, are 
you know, are, are coming to see. And they're, they're talking about that now with the Great Barrier Reefs and so on. So mm -hmm. my my thing was these these reefs in Mexico, uh, all these tour companies come and, you know, people are standing on top of the reefs and ru ruining the coral and so on. The video ended up being a really, it was filmed by Deborah Samuels, um, who's a really interesting photographer too. But because of the pressures from the record company, you know, it's kind of us having a good time on the beach. And, you know, I guess my biggest <laughs> afterwards was like, where were all the fish? You know, where's the, you know, we filmed all this stuff underwater and it kind of disappeared. Um, uh, so now this work again is kind of looking at these, you know, the processes and making them visible. So these biodiversity gardens in Padua, Italy, it has one of the oldest gardens in Europe that is that was a, a garden where they collected plants so I think it goes back to like 1550 or something wow. but they made That's this amazing. new garden these new gardens and so each pavilion is dedicated <laughs> to the diversity of plants in a certain location and of course these kind of things are just the most artificial recreations of you know they're they're kind of like these little planets um but they're you know the, there's culturally and artistically they're like this interesting blend of the natural and the artificial yeah. Yeah. And, and it but it's just by putting these objects on top in the studio uh I was kind of looking at the processes like photosynthesis and the way they exhalation and um you know making visible what's invisible and that's something I've always been interested in in my in my photography is that I make things disappear by doing really long exposures. And so here I'm kind of presenting a, maybe a mo more poetic version of how these things, you know, exist and are, are important. So, um, and that these ones too, these uh, understory uh, where I collected plant materials from the understory of plants, which are important for the regeneration of, you know, making soil and going back into the earth and um, and laying them right on top of the photograph while I was exposing the image. So again, if you can see the comparison to the cyanotypes, and I think doing the cyanotypes made me think about doing this in the dark room and putting these objects on top. So you actually have the real plant and the scale of the plant on top of the image. And I again, I print these myself. Um, uh, I was doing them at the Banff Center and this is the last work I did last year before the BAMP Center closed up and it mm. is still closed. So it's quite sad because uh, there's not many of these facilities around to be able to do this work. So it's kind of on hold. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's really interesting too that you're exploring kind of the um, the understory of these like old growth forests because I feel like this has become a really um, like hot, not a hot topic, it's, but it's an important topic, but it's something that's like really been cropping up I feel in mainstream media lately. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a book, there's a book called The Understory that was released, um, I think it won the Pulitzer, um, that was written maybe in 2018 or 19. Have you read this book? No, but I should get it. I have been reading a lot of the ones, just even in terms of the, the, you know, the molds and the fungus that grow underneath and how the roots connect and that there's this whole language and, you know, conversations that trees and plants have. So we look yeah. at the old forest, and the big trees are impressive, but it's the stuff that's happening understory and underground. That exactly. Also, the trees wouldn't survive without it, obviously. Exactly. And sorry, the book's actually called Overstory, not Understory. Overstory, that's right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. great. And yeah, it's, it speaks a lot about like these inter, these underground connections that we are yeah. invisible to us, but so, so important to creating life in these forests. So that's um, one of the things I think with the four of us too, is this kind of you know, documentary work without being, you know, the decisive image straight documentary. I mean, we yeah. add, in, we, we try, I think we all are about storytelling um, in these places that, you know, so it brings in this kind of poetic aspect uh, and involving other, other materials and this kind of three dimensionality rather than just a straight, you know, flat image. Yeah, and actually that's kind of a nice way to segue into, um into Sarah's work. So last but certainly not least, I'd like to talk to Sarah, of course. Um, uh, you had said something to Diane, uh, a blend of the natural and the artificial in your work. And I find this uh, is particularly true with Sarah and her one of her newest bodies of work, Refugio from 2018. Um, so I'm hoping that Sarah can kind of speak to us a little bit about this particular body of work, um, which to me kind of seems like 
a nice culmination of the work that we've been discussing so far. So, you know, it's not cyanotype print, but there's lots of um, kind of blue, like photographs that were printed with blue um, dye, I guess, or I'm not fully aware of the process. Sarah can explain it a bit better than me. Um, but also this real interest in the effects of human intervention on ecosystems and organisms. So uh, I'd love to hear from you, Sarah, and you can talk a bit about this particular body of work and how it came about, if, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. You can hear me. Yes. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess the slide we're looking at now is one of the main pieces in the show, which was um, sort of a reimagined version of Daguerre's diorama. So the diorama um, Daguerre built in, in Paris in the early 19th century, which had uh, multiple stages and the audience would go inside to have an experience. This is like pre-cinema, pre-photo. Um, and what kinds of things that, that the audience would learn when they went in there or be exposed to. And so uh, I was interested that in this as a piece of architecture and also the connection to the history of photography. But concurrently, as I think it sounds like we all work this way, we have like so many ideas floating in the, in the ether. Um, I learned about this insect that lived off the coast of Australia, Australia called the Lord House Dick insect, which um, was basically thought to be extinct, but then was rediscovered by a, a group of climbers on Ball's Pyramid. And so this story of um, our interaction as humans with these minute small things that are actually really important to the broader ecosystem was something I was interested in. And so I constructed this theater that people could enter into to learn the story of this insect and another insect called the, um, the ice, well, the ice bug or the rock crawler, um, which is a bug that was is found in North America and Alpine regions near Banff, where I spent a lot of time. And it's uh, one of these insects that actually is adapted to cold weather. So this idea also that um, animals and, and plants can be, you know, evolved to a certain environment. And, and we as humans have this uh, you know, can really disrupt those environments. So it's about that idea of entering into that space to think about it. And the diorama historically often showed images of the sublime kind of alpine mm -hmm. environment. So yeah, it seemed like a good tie-in. So subverting that um, kind of voyeuristic gaze in a, in a sense. Yeah, that, and also like the original would have promoted. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and also just drawing this this connection between like a refugio for for humans is an alpine hut. It's where where we would go to be protected from the elements. But for these insects, the refuge is that environment. So if it's no longer there, they don't have anywhere else to go. Basically, right. yeah, yeah. Um, and then this this is sort of grows out of that research to this series of uh, photograms, which are actually cutouts of reserves and like park reserves in Western Canada, the United States. So um, coming out of this research from William Newmark that, um, you know, is, is I think best intentions to have a space, an area kind of set aside for, for preservation, but kind of isolating it from the larger environment can often lead to functioning like an island and this idea that islands are actually very fragile and, and um, you know, certain animals need a certain amount of space in order to survive. So what happens if you cut that out? of the larger environment. So I was, this idea of islands is, was a big part of this project. Mm -hmm. And then the blue, um, mm -hmm. those are actually sea prints. So down in the traditional color darkroom at Banff. Um, and uh, the blue color was actually an accident at first. I turned on the tungsten light in the darkroom and that reacted with the Fuji paper to create this blue. I, I'd already been working with a blue tone with the video edit because both of those insects are nocturnal. So thinking about layering in the perspective of an insect, you know, I mean, that's a human idea the, that we see night kind of on a blue tone, mm -hmm. but I was trying to think of this way of uh, integrating that other view of the landscape through the, the color as well. I love that it was like a happy accident. It's such a beautiful <laughs> color, really. It, yeah, and it was like, that's exactly the color I'm going for. I yeah. mean, I did end up printing some other ones using the filtration and the color and larger, but the initial experiments were a total fluke. <laughs> So, yeah. I also wanted to uh, talk to you and Diana a little bit about um, the Institute of Unusual Studies, which mm -hmm. is kind of like, I, we've been discussing it as like a research collaboration kind of uh, environment. So I'm hoping that you can both talk a little bit about it because I find, I find it really interesting. And I, I think it began with the two of you, but I feel like it's expanded and become like a, a space for all four of you to kind of experiment. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Well, the, yeah, I think so. No, just yeah. because I'll, I'll get uh, my friend Andrew Zeely is listening to this and he'll go, no, the Institute of Unusual Studies started back in the 1980s. And it did. We did this collaboration on this record called Taking Sides. And we 
put, we each took a side of the vinyl and I decided that I would do this recording as the Institute of Unusual Studies and did some little movies and, and so on. So it, I always kind of hung on to that name. And when Sarah and I started, you know, working together on this exhibition, See Attached and doing stuff, I, I think we joked about it for a long time being the institute that, you know, we worked in because we were just interested in unusual studies. And um, so eventually it became uh, this, this kind of room at the side of, uh, of an exhibition that we did called See Attached which was kind of like a reading room and a room where you could do unusual studies, but all these weird little projections and things were happening in the room. I don't know, Sarah, you can talk a bit about the... Yeah, it was sort of, I think it kind of functioned as like a research room for the, like the Sea Attached exhibition was a call and response kind of game that Diane and I made up when we were, uh, Diane actually was in France and I was in Banff and we wanted to continue our artistic conversation. So we did like, the, like a digital version of a male mail art kind of thing and then we showed that in the main space but this this side room was really like this um, place to experiment and we found you know furniture from the University of Lethbridge theater department including that kind of space space age area, avian chair and like projection and stuff so yeah a place to kind of hang out and think and read the books in the bookshelf um, and they're related to our research as artists and then yeah, and okay no. Yeah, oh, I, well, I was going to say, I, I keep hearing Banff over, over and over. It seems like this was um, like a really important place for all four of you at, at one point, or maybe at the same time as well. Um, I'm wondering if maybe we can also talk a bit about your experiences at Banff and how they kind of, or how being there has maybe shaped the work that you make. Um, maybe we can start with Marianne um, uh, and, then I'll, and then go from there. How the, how the, how the BAMP Center mm -hmm. has, uh, oh, where do I start? <laughs> um, I think, I think the BAMP Center, although I go uh, to the BAMP Center to you generally to produce specific bodies of art, um, I, I for one become greatly influenced by the, um, my exposure to other people's practices and because you're in close proximity with other people from different disciplines. Um, so uh, I think that that cross pollination has been really, really great. Uh, as far as how it informs my work, that's, it's, it's, it's a, a unique and a strange and wonderful place. Um, but I, th I think th the only thing I could say is uh, about that, just in regards to some of the cyanotypes uh, that I produced there, which is over probably about over 20 years ago, some of the first cyanotypes I, I did for a show at the Walter Phillips Gallery. And I was, I was doing the exposures in February and they were like two hour long exposures out in the freezing cold and the snow. <laughs> with these gigantic um, pieces. And then there was this raven that was always watching me and croaking at me. And I thought, yeah, everyone's a critic. So uh, <laughs> the, ra the ravens, the raven, actually the ravens in Banff and the ravens in Loran and the ravens uh, at the Tower of London have all worked their way into new artworks that I'm making right now. So I guess they've affected me back then and continue to affect me now. And uh, Penelope, you hadn't actually had a chance, you were, you were telling me to study in Banff, but you have been there and you've attended conferences, is that right? Yes, yes. Um, so I um, was supposed to go to Banff, was very excited, but um, there were some family issues. And so I had to decline my place, but I was able to attend the conference at the end. And it was so inspiring and so exciting that I came back and uh, to Toronto and decided that I wanted to go to grad school. So that was my, you know, my experience of BAMP sort of generating um, what I loved were the discussions. I loved the conversation. And I thought the only way I can get that in-depth conversation is to be, um, well, I thought at the time was to be, was to go to grad school. So. And now you've continued that kind of in-depth conversation with, um, with the four of you with this kind of yeah. I keep calling it a collective. I don't know if that's correct, but um, I kind of am understanding it as a, a bit of a collective. I think it's becoming that. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're, we're, we're always in the process of becoming something, right? You know, so it's, it's, it's nice. It's, um, 
Yeah, because that, that's what I find that those kind of conversations just so generative, you know. Um, Actually, uh, speaking of that, and, and I'm aware of the time too, I know we're kind of coming to a close, <laughs> but I did, I did want to ask the four of you um, about, so this, this picture was taken in southern, <laughs> southwestern France. I think that Marianne took it and it's uh, Sarah I and did. Diane. And you were here as well, Penelope, is that right? Yes, yes, yeah. I was. So I'm probably so one of those little people, you know? <laughs> right, yes, in and amongst the cars. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you all, um, you know, you've traveled together quite a bit. You have done lots of work, you know, in together in workshops, like in a particular place in a particular time. And I imagine that COVID has kind of uh, affected as, it, as it's affected everyone, but really affected the way that you communicate and work together. So, especially because you're all from different parts of the country and getting together at this moment is very difficult. Um, so I wanted to ask you all kind of how the pandemic has affected your working relationship, maybe, you know, for better or for worse. Um, do you, maybe we could start with, oh, Diane, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, because we had planned in 2020 to actually do kind of a master class, just the four of us, because generally Sarah and I are, are teaching and there's other artists that, um, come and get involved. But because, you know, we, we could see that there was something, you know, I mean, we were great friends, but also just these, that we really wanted just to work, work together as the, uh, the four of us without distraction, we had planned this time uh, for last year. And of course that didn't happen. And, um, or was it supposed to be for this year? Yeah, it was for last year, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. last year. I'm, you know what, 2020 is like this year that'll just be this blank. Um, <laughs> anyways, it's, which is probably good. Um, anyways, we, yeah, we started just communicating way more on the internet and with Zoom and stuff. And so now we're developing ideas for group and exhibition together and so on. So oddly enough, I mean, think Sarah, what we were saying, we probably have communicated more because I'm in Calgary, Sarah's in Winnipeg, uh, the other two are in Ontario. So yes, we live quite far apart. So when we see each other, we usually see each other in another, another place and time. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I would. I mean, I'd agree. Like we we uh, have been speaking more and actually developing ideas more and having conversations throughout Zoom and in the last year or so, and realizing that we have these threads and are now kind of working towards maybe a collective project. <laughs> so that definitely, uh, I don't know. Maybe it would have evolved eventually into that state, but I think it was uh, definitely aided by. Yeah, I think Zoom really helped because I think Diane, you had talked about us doing a, a group project prior to COVID. Um, in Banff and so we were sort of talking about that and then I had a connection in France and then so we were thinking oh well, that might be interesting but they were kind of loose discussions or conversations and then COVID came and suddenly those conversations became more focused and right. then of course this lovely opportunity from the power plant to to do something and I thought immediately well this would kind of tie in so yeah, no, I think it's really wonderful that we got to hear from all four of you today and kind of see, like really see the overlap and like the, the different threads that you all kind of are pulling at that are different, but similar, right? Like, I think yeah. it seems like a very fruitful space to be in. And I can imagine that having that extra time that COVID brought um, to, to many people, I can see that being really helpful in a way in order to kind of pick apart those threads a bit more. Yeah, I, I would say I have, I'm not doing as much physical work, but it's the, the thinking about it. And, and, you know, when we meet, then we're, you know, writing up ways of, you know, of thinking about the work together and so on. So it's, it's that it's like the first time, you know, when, when I think a lot of us have had time where we can actually sit and contemplate what we're doing rather than just always making stuff and there's an exhibition and this and this and this. So um, you know, it's made this pause, forced a pause upon us. But um, yeah, we have to look at the benefits of that, which has been really mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know we're, we're kind of coming to a close. I just want to thank all four of you for participating in this in conversation. I'm going to hand it over to Chelsea in a minute um, so she can do the kind of closing remarks. But I'm, I really have enjoyed getting to know you all a bit better and to get to know your practice a bit better. Um, I, I'm really excited for what you do next. I think it's going to be incredible. And yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining me and taking the time today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Justine. Justine. Well, thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> I need to get one of those. That's perfect. Yeah, it was better than that. <laughs> okay, I'll hand it over to Chelsea. Um, it was nice to see you all, and thank you again, and thanks to the audience for joining us. Uh, it's thank lovely, you. lovely to have you all. Um, we'll hopefully talk again soon. Yes. Thanks very much. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Great, thank you, Marianne, Diane, Sarah, Penelope, and Justine for having us all be a part of your conversation this afternoon. For those of you who have joined us, this is a reminder that we will be hosting another field trip program on Saturday, April 17th at 1 p.m. that will feature artist Jared Federa in conversation with the Power Plants Curator of Education and Public Programs, Josh Human. You can learn more about this program and others that are coming up online at thepowerplant.org. This now concludes our program. Have a great day and thank you everyone for joining us. Bye.